Next time! Hey, you get me! Hey, you get me! Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Brother Bona Muhammad. Um, uh, people know me, I guess, as a spoken word poet, you know, slash performance poet, storyteller. Um, I'm actually, you know, of an Oromo descent. My ancestry is the Oromo people in Ethiopia, who are actually the largest ethnic group in all of East Africa. A lot of people don't know that about us, but uh, I'm not Somali, just in case you're wondering, because a lot of people think that as well. <laughs> and uh, alhamdulillah, my parents, you know, left Ethiopia as political refugees, they were escaping a civil war that was taking place in the late 70s and uh, they migrated to Egypt and from Egypt they went to Canada and so I was actually born in Canada so alhamdulillah I'm, I'm Canadian, uh, African, Muslim alhamdulillah but Islam is really the focus of my life. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before you basically started practicing Islam, like yeah. where you're coming from, your background etc. Yeah, the area that I grew up in in Toronto wasn't, um, you know alhamdulillah wasn't a bad bad area but it wasn't an area by which you know a lot of people had direction in their lives. I grew up in an area that was actually very diverse, one of the most diverse areas in Toronto, where I had you know a lot of friends which were um, you know Italians, Portuguese. I went to a Jewish elementary school populated area. A lot of my friends, I grew up down the road from actually Little Jamaica, the highest population of Jamaicans outside of Jamaica. So that was you know my influence was this you know very multicultural diverse background but unfortunately I didn't grow up with a lot of Muslims uh, even though I was from a Muslim family there wasn't a strong Muslim influence and um, for me it was very easy to identify with you know other groups because you know when you come into these places you know even though I'm, I'm Oromo from Ethiopia to them I was just black that's all it meant so being black meant that, you know, I had to be like the blacks that I knew, which were the Jamaicans and the West Indians and, you know, people of that background who, you know, unfortunately were not Muslim. And so they really shaped my understanding of life. And so I grew up, you know, very confused, like a lot of these youth we see nowadays, very confused as to my identity. You know, was I African? Was I black? Was I Muslim? Was I this? Was I that? Was I Canadian? Was I, you know, and so... I think like many youth, I really found my identity, you know, shifted from like day to day. You know, this day I was with these people and then when I played soccer, I was with my Italian friends and then when I went to parties, I was with my white friends and then I went, you know, down the road, I see all my Jamaican friends and and I was, alhamdulillah, my family did, you know, I did go to madrasa. I went, you know, on the weekends and learned the Quran, but just the weekends wasn't enough. You know what I'm saying? The weekend thing, it was, wasn't really working for me because I would be just even more confused as to who I was. So that eventually ended up, you know, leading me astray and leading me to a direction where, you know, I completely just forgot about my Islam. I completely forgot about everyone I was with and the things that, you know, I really kind of took as a religion was like hip hop. You know, hip hop became like a religion for me. And this is a very sad and scary thing to say that it is a dean of a lot of people. You know, and people say, and if you're familiar with the hip hop lifestyle, you know that hip hop it, you know, it's more than a music. It's more than just music. It's a culture. You know, it shapes the way you dress. It shapes the people you hang out with. It shapes your language. It shapes your culture. So in many ways, it becomes like a deen. It becomes like a religion. And so this was the earliest sense of religion that I had was the street culture, hip hop, you know what I'm saying, break dancing, graffiti, emceeing, all that kind of stuff. That was really, you know, my introduction to life. And that's, uh, you know, how I lived my life for quite a while, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, my parents were always big on education. So one thing that, you know, I never took for granted was the fact that even though I was in the streets and I was mingling with, you know, people that I shouldn't have been with, I still stayed in school. Alhamdulillah, I finished my high school at the top of my grade. Um, I actually was the valedictorian of my graduating class. So I was the one who gave, you know, the, the commencement speech on behalf of the, the graduating class. And people knew me as a joker. People knew me as somebody who, you know, was fun and I was loud and I liked to, you know, like to be on the stage. At that point, I was doing a lot of theater. And uh, I just kind of just barely got into writing and I started, you know, performing my raps and the things that I was, you know, accustomed to at that time. I have a theory. I think that if we just taught kids how to be themselves, then we would have no need for a therapist or prison cells. Because you see, in school, I was the token black guy. And to fit in, ooh, I would do whatever it takes. But Black History Month was the only time that I could get a date. <laughs> you see, we have a tendency to fear what we do not know because sometimes the scariest thing that you can ever hear in life is no. 
No, you are not popular, and no, you are not cool, and no, you will not become anything even if you finish school. You know, it was it wasn't until you know there was I remember in in high school particularly at the end of my high school years there was one brother and one Somali brother, mashallah who was on Deen, and this was very strange for us because, you know, a lot of us, even though my last name was Muhammad, you know, people didn't really think of me as a Muslim. And remember, this was like right after 9-11. So I was living, you know, this was like 2001, 2002 was when I was like in my high school days. So I remember at that time, you know, people would start saying things like, you know, oh, these Muslims are like this and like that. And me not knowing anything really about my own religion, I kind of just remained quiet, you know, because I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be made fun of. I didn't want people to start, you know, making fun of me and, and insulting me. So I just became one of those, you know, from Muhammad's to Mo's, you know, I just really became a Mo. I became quiet and I really felt, you know, that sadness in my heart. Like even now to this day when I look back, because I remember there was that brother, this one Somali brother, mashallah, who, you know, would try and gather the, the few Muslims that were in our school. And he tried to set up a, a, like a Jummah prayer. And, uh, you know, many of us didn't really take it serious. And unfortunately... You know, I, I really kind of, I found it hard to, I felt like at, at some points I was too busy trying to impress my non-Muslim friends to, you know, embrace this Muslim brother who was trying to give me da'wah, who was trying to, you know, kind of call me back to what was true. And it became, you know, even harder for me as I graduated from high school and I went to university because in university, obviously you're met with so many different cultures and lifestyles and people really at that age feel like they're free. You know, this is the age when you, a lot of people leave their parents' house, they go live on campus. A lot of people start, you know, going to parties and start doing things that they wouldn't have normally have done. And in that age, you know, like subhanAllah, like a lot of kids, you know, I felt even more lost when you start mixing in with the party scene and you start, you know, I mean, brothers know what happens when you, you know, see girls on the road and sisters start getting picked up by guys. And, and it was, you know, a big fitna for me, subhanAllah. And uh, I really found myself caught up in a lot of bad relationships. And I made a lot of bad friends who, unfortunately, you know, were part of my deen that I had, you know, developed at that time. The religion that I was following, which was like this hip-hop lifestyle, street culture, kind of urban thing. Which, unfortunately, you know, didn't really do much for me in the, in the long run. Because a lot of those brothers and sisters, you know, they didn't really have my back in the end. And there's a lot of things that I went through that really helped me, you know, showed me the light. That these people weren't my real friends and, uh, you know, that was kind of that. Was there a stage in your life that you started to feel to yourself that, you know what? I'm a Muslim, this, this lifestyle that I'm living is not correct. Did, did, did you ever start to feel like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what, as I was growing up, and uh, again, I was talking about, you know, what was happening in, in the, you know, Canada, US post 9-11, where a lot of people started attacking Islam, and these attacks were so blatant. I remember being in high school and, you know, there was a, a law class I was taking and there was a debate and people were talking about, you know, whether women should be, you know, I, whether women should be taking off hijabs and, and, and passport pictures. And I remember, you know, getting really heated with people. And at that time, I really, I knew in my heart that Islam was the truth. I knew in my heart that this, there was only one God and that, you know, this was the correct path. And I wanted to, you know, speak up about Islam. So I secretly, you know, I started learning and researching on my own. And even though I wasn't confident enough to come out and start, you know, uh, battling people or telling people off, like, I just needed to, to learn enough that I could be basically in a private conversation, explain to somebody that, look, this is actually not what Islam says. You know, Islam is like this, Islam is like that. And I remember, I'll tell you one story, subhanAllah, that really, I remember was a big change point in my life. Because even though at that point in my life, I started identifying more as a Muslim, but post 9-11, if your last name was Muhammad, khalas, you're a Muslim. It didn't even matter if you're practicing, you weren't practicing, right? But I remember one time, subhanAllah, I was with some guys. There were some, some guys that I used to hang out with. And, um, you know, at that time, you know, I'm ashamed to say, but like I used to, you know, I used to indulge in certain activities, you know, whether it be partying, you know, the type of lifestyle that comes with partying, the type of things people do, extracurricular stuff people do. And I remember I was, you know, doing this particular thing. And, a, and a, you know, a guy asked me, he's like, you know, Muhammad, yeah, you, you're a Muslim? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Muslim. And he's like, but Muslims don't do this. Yeah, he started telling me, Muslims don't act like this. And I said to myself, well, you know, well, you know I didn't, <laughs> I was just embarrassed, subhanAllah. I was really embarrassed for a non-Muslim to tell me that, you know, I shouldn't be partying and I shouldn't be out and I shouldn't be doing this. It really was a blow to my ego because, you know, I felt like even this person knew that Islam did not condone my behavior. So, you know, if this was correct, then what type of person was I? And a lot of times when the truth comes our way, you know, as Muslims, sometimes we take offense to it. When somebody might give you advice or somebody might say to you, you know, brother, you know, fear Allah, brother, sister, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. 
Sometimes our own nafs, our own egos will take the best of us and we'll not take that advice sincerely and instead we'll just take it as a personal attack. And I felt like the Muslims that I knew that were around me were just like that. You know, they were Muslims that would attack you. And I remember I hated going to the masjid because the masjid that I went to, that, them times I used to braid my hair. And them times I used to have long hair. I know you, you don't probably don't believe it now, but at that time I used to have long, long, long hair. And I used to braid my hair and I used to come to the masjid like for a Jummah or, you know, for Eid and stuff like that. And the way the uncles used to stare at me, the way everybody used to look at me like, you know, look at this brother. Why does he look like that? He looks like a calf. And I would say, yo, boy, you guys, I don't want to come in this building. And I'm saying, I don't want to be around people who are going to treat me and look at me a certain way. And they're not going to, you know, give me the respect as a Muslim. And so that was enough incentive for me to stay away from the masajid, to stay away from the house of Allah. And this is the type of da'wah people were giving back then. And you still see it to this day. You know, you might see a sister walk in the masjid without a hijab and you say, oh, sister, what is she doing in here? How could she come in here looking like that? And you think to yourself, subhanAllah, is the masjid not the place for the sick people to go to? Is the masjid not the place? Is, is you know, are these not the hajj or people whose hearts are away from Allah and that they should be getting closer to him? And so, you know, I really I identified as a Muslim, but I hated Muslims. I loved Islam, but I, I really was not fond of the Muslims themselves. And alhamdulillah, you know, I really took the time out on my own to try and learn Islam you know, free of cultural interpretations, free of people's own, you know, understandings and misinter misinterpretations of the deen. And I tried my best to, you know, actually read the Quran. A lot of us, you know, in our lifetime, I think very few people have actually read the entire Quran, even in your own language, in English, from front to back. Very few people have actually read the entire book. And so I took it upon myself, you know, one year that I said to myself, you know what? In this Ramadan, it was in a month of Ramadan, it was the beginning of Ramadan, and I, I really said to myself, you know what, one, one year, I'm going to actually, you know, learn to pray. Because, I mean, first of all, I didn't know how to pray. As a Muslim, you'd be going to the masjid, you know, you'd be going for a salah, and then you say, Allah Akbar, and you go down, and you just, you know, just feel like you're just a robot, you don't really know what you're doing. And so, I really had this connection that was lost, subhanAllah. You know, this was one thing in my life that was missing, and, and you know, a person who prayed and then hasn't prayed will know this feeling you know because the salah becomes something which is like you know your heartbeat and imagine i just i felt that need to get closer to allah i didn't know how i didn't even know where to begin i didn't know which books to read i didn't and and it was really sad too how i know i'm rambling but you know the brothers that i knew to be practicing the people that i knew to be like good muslims to me they were just nerds like i couldn't you know what i'm saying i couldn't really sit with them i couldn't they didn't look like me they didn't talk like me they didn't understand where i was coming from they didn't see the lifestyle that i lived before to understand the scrub the struggles that i was going through even for someone like me to pray or to fast it was a big deal you know to drop everything you were doing and that's why i said like i felt like a revert because i really was coming from a very very far distance from the deen and the people around me were not very supportive. And it had a lot to do with my friends because the people, I mean, my non-Muslim friends, they couldn't care less. They thought it was strange that I, you know, didn't want to smoke or I didn't want to drink or anything. They thought I was uh, something wrong with me. And then the Muslim people that I was trying to connect with, you know, they thought I was, you know, I looked strange because I had braids in my hair and they thought that, you know, my pants were a certain level and my, my pants were too saggy so they couldn't really check me either. And it just became a big fitna for me. But, you know, alhamdulillah, slowly and surely I started coming closer in my own way. You know, one year in the month of Ramadan, I, I really try to commit myself to, you know, making this Ramadan the best one possible. And for me, that really involved, you know, first of all, learning how to pray because I didn't know how to pray correctly. And, uh, you know, it's a shame, too, because you're a Muslim your whole life, but you don't know the basics. There's a lot of things that I didn't know. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't really know how to fast. I didn't really know, you know, the basic fundamental pillars of Islam. So that year, I remember one of my cousins, he sent around a video just like for people that, you know, he thought might need it. And it was just like a guide to pray. So I said, okay, alhamdulillah, let me watch this video. I remember studying it like it was an exam, you know. Okay, he goes up, he says, Sami Allah, Hulima. And just knowing these things and from my childhood, but just trying to refresh my memory. So alhamdulillah, you know, I, I tried my best in that month to fast and, you know, an actual fast. A fast which was not just a restraining from food, but it was restraining from, you know, from idle talk. It was restraining from looking at things I shouldn't be looking at. It was restraining from, you know, you know doing all the things which you shouldn't be doing. And... I remember that month, you know, I had an iPod, I gave it away, you know, you have a girlfriend, you dump your girlfriend, you know, this is the month where, mashallah, you're going hard, you know what I'm saying, you're trying to put everything aside for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that month, you know, really did a lot for my life, because I remember that's the month when I really established my salah, and I, you know, alhamdulillah, I don't think to that, from that day till now, I've ever missed a salah, so that was like a big, you know, a big, big positive for me, and it really helped impact my life, and at, after that point, you know, 
it became so much easier, subhanAllah. They always say that the signs of an accepted Ramadan is when you continue the things you were doing in the month of Ramadan. And for me, it was, you know, a huge changing point in my life. And I almost felt like this huge burden had been lifted off my shoulders. Because at that point, I remember I was, I was living on my own. I wasn't living with my parents. I was, you know, I was just really, really frustrated. And, and my heart just felt really, really sick. And I remember after that month, subhanAllah, during that month, just feeling this sense of relief, slowly feeling as though the pressure was releasing and slowly feeling as though I had purpose and direction in my life and getting an idea of, you know, who I was and what I wanted to be and really putting away all the people around me, you know, not caring for what people said. My own friends started, you know, basically, you know, they started making fun of me or they started telling me that what I was doing was weird. And mind you, they were non-Muslim, so they didn't really understand anyways. And for me, it was important that, you know what, forget them, forget you. I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jalla is the only one that in my life really mattered. And for me, that was a big turning point in my life because, you know, that month of Ramadan particularly was a time when I decided to change my, my life around. And, you know, to this day, alhamdulillah, it's, you know, been similarly put on the same path. But this world is full of signs from the moon to the stars in the sky, from the bees and the bugs, like a seed in your blood, like a fiend or a drug, makes you need to look up and question what's up. Why you deal with this stuff when your spirits are crushed and you trek through the rough, but like thunder it struck, said B, and it was all the signs that were sent, they finally make sense. You Feel the torment, so you need to repent when your heart is cemented it's hard as a brick. Cause your soul is worth more than the dollars and cents. All the money in the world couldn't buy you happiness. Cause verily it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts do find rest. What is it like now practicing the deen? Are you better now or were you better off before? People don't realize, but Islam in itself is not meant to be, you know, just a set of boring rules that you follow and it's just this tradition and you wear this thing and you do this and you go like that. And No, Islam is actually a, it's guiding principles to help shape a person's life. And it's not like the rules we know of in our everyday society in Western world that were just made by men and today they like them, tomorrow they don't like them, so they change them. No, Islam was designed by the one who designed everything. Right? The creator of all created Islam as a perfect methodology for living your life. So, wallahi, this deen for me has been just that. You know, and I always say this statement, people don't understand me, but I'm not a religious person. I'm very rational in my thinking. And for me, Islam is the rational choice. Because you understand, you know, that, okay, you know, we shouldn't drink uh, alcohol because A, B, and C. We shouldn't eat pork because A, B, C. You know, we shouldn't be doing this because of that. And every rule, alhamdulillah, we can come up with rule. We can come up with reasons why you shouldn't be doing it. But the real reason why we live the way we live is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to. That's it. That's what it comes down to. You know, the little bit of knowledge that I have now tells me that I should be accepting and understanding the things that I don't understand. Because I know that these, this, this set of rules, this law, this lifestyle that I have been given as a choice is not for my burden, it's not to make my life miserable, but instead it's to help me in so many ways. And wallahi, that's exactly what it's done. You know, I have clear focus and understanding. And you just think the problems that you had yesterday, if you look at them through your Islamic eyes, right? If you look at them through the, the I guess, metaphorically, the eyes of the deen, everything becomes clear. Whether it's, you know, poverty, whether it's suffering, whether it's pain, whether it's joy, whether it's happiness, whether it's marriage, whether it's divorce, whether it's death, whether it's life, all these things have a perfect understanding. You know, I know the reason why I'm living the way I'm living. I know the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing or what I'm not doing what I'm not doing, right? This religion for me is more than just, you know, a set of rules. It's a lifestyle choice that has been given to me by the one who knows what's best for me, you know, just like as... A parent, you would look after your children, you would tell your child, you know what, you got to drink your milk. And your child might not understand. The child might say, I don't know why I have to drink milk. I don't know why I have to read. I don't know why I have to go to school. We are that child sometimes because we as Muslims are just as human beings. Sometimes we don't understand, you know, why these things are put in place. But Islam for me has just really given me a purpose and an understanding of why I've been put on this earth. And there's nothing more beautiful than, you know, a clear mission statement. Everything, you know, can get, people's lives can get very blurry and you can sometimes forget, you know, the reason why you're being tested or the reason why you've been given this wealth or the reason why, you know, you haven't been given this spouse or whatever it may be. But as Muslims, alhamdulillah, we say in the bad, we say alhamdulillah. In the good, we say alhamdulillah. Everything is alhamdulillah, ya rabbil alameen, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who loves us more than we love ourselves, more than our parents love us, more than our mother loves us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. 
any trial I've gone through in my life now as a practicing Muslim, it makes sense. You know, any good that's come to me as a practicing Muslim makes sense. I know how to do it. I know how to deal with it. And this was not what my life was like before. Things would happen to you and you just, you'd lose your mind. You know, things would happen that would be bad and you would not know how to take it. Things would happen that would be good and you would just think so good of yourself. And it just extremes. You know, Islam is the middle. Islam tells you to understand that, look, you know, if something good happens to you, then you should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should have, you know, you should basically take that shukr and you should act upon it. And if something bad happens to you, you should say, you know, alhamdulillah, you should turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have sabr with what Allah has, patience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. So this to me was like the, the, the polar opposite of what I knew from before. And it really, you know, I, I can't stress that fact enough. It gave me direction and it gave me a purpose to my life, which, you know, I didn't really have before. Back in the day, they say that I came from slaves. As though being a slave is something that would make me ashamed. Touche, homie. You would actually be amazed to know that we are all slaves. But in what kind of way? I mean, some people submit to cigarettes smoking five times a day. and Some people worship money only to see it go away. A couple people put their faith in whatever the weatherman say, and some people even pray to the sun. But I wonder who created the sun anyways. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us that you were on the religion of your friends. You know, you were on this lifestyle of your friends. And I think that this advice, you know, the Prophet ﷺ gave us is so pertinent in our times because many of us choose our friends like we choose, you know, basically cereal at the grocery store with really not much choice, just whatever looks appealing at the time. But imagine that, you know, the person who wants to get married, you know, when you're looking for the right wife or husband, you know, you're going to start inquiring about this person's background. You want to know about their family. You want to know about their religion. You want to know about their wealth. You want to know about everything about them. And this is the person who, you know, you're going to be spending the rest of your life with. When we're looking for friends, you know, we don't really care. You know, I've known this guy since I was two. I've known this person since I was 10 or this person has known me since then. And so that becomes a reason why you're friends with this person. But you know, to be honest, I think that we have to start choosing our friends like we choose our spouses. You know, your friends should be of top notch quality. Your friends should be A or A pluses only. You know, because if you're with somebody who is not gonna make you a better person, then that person unfortunately is not a friend that you should be taking. We need to learn to have friends who don't wanna just be friends in this dunya, but they want to be your next door neighbors in Jannah. How many friends do you have like that? Friends are going to remind you, brother, sister, fear Allah. Brother, sister, let's establish the salah. How many friends are you going to have that are going to tell you, brother and sister, that what you're doing is wrong? I don't think that's a good action. You know, unfortunately, many of our friends have just become people that we know. And when I started practicing, and I, I, I don't want it to sound like a, you know, a, an arrogant thing or whatever, but I had to cut a lot of people off. And you really have to sometimes, you know, you got to figure out what is your priority? Why are you on this earth and what are you doing and how long are you going to be here for? That you can have time to mess around with people who don't have your same agenda and priority in mind. And so brothers and sisters, my advice to you is to pick your friends wisely and make sure the people you're surrounding yourselves are people who are going to remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in good times and in bad. And ultimately, you know, these people who you're with are going to shape your identity. And if there's some brother, some brother or sister who you think is not really doing that well, then you know it's okay, inshallah, be that support system for them. But don't allow your core group, don't allow the majority of your friends to be people who you constantly have to give da'wah to. No. Be amongst the people who will give da'wah to you as well, inshallah, and you can grow as people. So brothers and sisters, inshallah, I hope that this advice, you know, sincerely it works and it penetrates your hearts. And, you know, inshallah... You will be my friend in this world and you will benefit me. I will be your friend in this world, inshallah. And we will be the best of friends in the hereafter in Jannah for those, inshallah. I'd like to give a big jazakallah khair, a big thank you and shout out to Roadside to Islam for all the amazing work they're doing. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this act heavy on all of our skills of good deeds, inshallah. This is your brother, Bona Muhammad, signing off. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.